So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Over the past few months, parents of children with autism across the province have been protesting. And they've been protesting for good reason. Doug Ford and Lisa McLeod have introduced an autism plan that will steal the livelihood of children with autism. They say that they are giving parents more choice, but they are giving parents no choice at all. The Ford plan is to shift what should be his government's responsibility into schools. It's a plan to give teachers a one-day course, a plan in hope of that the problem would just simply disappear. Quite simply, Doug Ford is seeking to balance the budget on the backs of children with autism. The PC plan does not fund ABA therapy, the therapy the kids most in need require, because 20,000 or less will not cover it. Under Ford's plan, only the wealthy or those parents willing to forfeit everything, their house, their car, their dreams, will be able to afford ABA therapy. I met with a, a mom in my riding yesterday and her and her family are faced with that stark choice. With all this in mind, we have a panel of experts here today and all of us have one simple, powerful message for this government, pause the plan. Pause the plan and go back to the drawing board. Pause the plan and consult with parents and experts. Pause the plan and give kids therapy based on their individual needs because no two kids and no two families are the same. I want to introduce you to the group of advocates and experts that we have here today. First, just over on the, onto the side, we have Miko. Miko is an autism self-advocate and a board member of the Ontario Autism Coalition. As well, we have Marg, the Executive Director of Autism Ontario. On the panel to my left is Mike Moffat. Mike is an assistant professor in the Business, Economics and Public Policy Group at the Ivy Business School. In 2017, Mike was the Chief Innovation Fellow for the Government of Canada, advising Deputy Ministers on Innovation Policy and Emerging Trends. He has also previously held the titles of Director of the Lawrence National Centre for Policy and the Management and Chief Economist for the Mowat Centre at the University of Toronto. Next to Mike is Dr. Nancy Walton. Nancy is the Director and Associate Professor in the Daphne Cockwell School of Nursing at Ryerson University. Her research examines the lived experience of parents providing therapy to their children with autism and developmental disorders. As a nurse ethicist, uh, she is uh, the chair of the Research Ethics Board at Women's College Hospital. Nancy is a proud mother of and advocate for Georgia, a wonderful 19-year-old who has autism. Following Nancy is Louis Bush. Louis is a board-certified behavior analyst, an autism sibling, the past president of the Ontario Association for Behavior Analysts, and an advocate for the accessible evidence-based treatment for individuals with autism, developmental disabilities, and mental health issues. And last but not least, we are joined by Laura Kirby McIntosh. In this current fight, Laura is working to broaden the, the base of the Ontario Autism Coalition, mentor future leaders, and leverage the power of social media. She believes that, uh, that she has not only an opportunity, but a duty a duty to use her unique skills to empower others and to determine that she will not rest until the individuals with autism, regardless of age, have the supports and services that they need. This is an accomplished group of experts who have been leaders in the autism community. There is no doubt in my mind that if Doug Ford had meaningfully consulted with these experts, we would not see this plan before us today. There is no wrong time to do the right thing. There is no shame in saying that you got it wrong and to committing to do better. We urge you to pause the plan. With that being said, let us pass it to Mike. Well, thank you. I'm here as an economist and a very proud father. I have two wonderful children, both on the spectrum and both on the wait list for services. Now, the Ford Auto Ontario Autism Program fails families on the spectrum, like mine, but it also fails Ontario taxpayers in three very clear ways. First, it is a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars. In times of austerity, it is crucial that every dollar be stretched as far as it can. We need to maximize return on investment. Ford's changes go in the opposite direction. Instead of letting professionals consider a child's actual needs where therapy dollars do the most good, 
This government made a political decision to, in their words, make sure everyone gets something. That would be appropriate if you're Oprah Winfrey handing out free iPads to every audience member, but it is in no way, uh, it is no way to handle an issue as delicate as health care. Under the Ford plan, some kids will get more funding than they can possibly use. For others, it means the year-long therapy they require will last only two weeks, at which point they will be mainstreamed into schools that are wholly unprepared. Giving some families a useless second iPad while other children have life-altering therapy stripped away is fiscal malpractice. Second, the income clawbacks are a steep new autism tax on family. A recent C.D. Howe report notes that governments need to be cautious of discouraging work by mothers and secondary earners in a family because taxes and benefit programs create extraordinarily high effective tax rates. Under the Ford plan, if a parent re-enters the workforce, their childhood budget for therapy is clawed back by up to 70, 70 cents for every dollar earned that year. This new autism tax eliminates any incentive for both parents to stay in the, in the labor force. Finally, the Ford Autism Program discriminates against girls. Let me repeat, Doug Ford's Autism Program discriminates against girls. Funding is based on the age a child is diagnosed. Because girls get diagnosed significantly later than boys, even when they have the same symptoms, girls will receive substantially less funding than boys simply because they are girls. My daughter is one of those girls that the Ford government is discriminating against. Judges will ultimately determine whether this form of gender discrimination is constitutional, but I know it's indefensible. I am pleading with the Ford government, delay these changes. Get rid of the wasteful one-size-fits-all model. Get rid of the autism tax and get rid of the discrimination against girls. Come back to the table. Let's work together to create a program that is action improvement on the old one. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for having me here today. I come to this with concerns that are both professional and deeply personal. It's important to note here that while we're talking a lot today about children with autism, we are talking about children and families, and we are talking about investments now in future adults with autism. This morning, before I left the house to be here, I helped my 19-year-old daughter Georgia get dressed. I braided her hair, I helped her put toothpaste on her toothbrush. While she is a wonderful young woman, musical, expressive, and funny, she is still unable to put socks on by herself. Without significant support through therapy, Georgia cannot accomplish the simple activities of daily living that so many of us take for granted to get ourselves out the door every morning. Parents I've talked to in my research have told me versions of this same thing, and often their stories are much more troubling. In many cases, these parents are less well equipped financially and professionally than I am. The proposed plan, by cutting clinically recommended therapies and providing minimal funding for each family with a one-size-fits-all approach, means that these same parents, many who have far fewer resources to start with and children with far more complex needs, will bear unreasonable burdens. An approach in which there are seemingly arbitrary age and income cutoffs, in other words, a system not based on individual needs, is, as Mike notes, irresponsible. As a society, we would never endorse allocating just a little bit of chemotherapy to all children with cancer, nor does it make sense to allocate a few antibiotics for every child with any type of infection. In the context of autism, those who claim that an approach providing a little of something to all is fair get two things wrong. First, they assume that children with autism and their families who support them all have equal needs. We know that this is not the case. If you have 20 children with autism who need supportive therapies, you will have 20 unique profiles of need. With the proposed plan, children with more complex needs will never come close to getting the intensity or variety of services and therapies that they need. Children with autism may well benefit from behavioral therapy, but they also need other types of therapies, such as occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, and psychology, supports that the previous program covered as part of meaningful parent choice. While you're hearing that parent choice has been increased in this plan, this is not the case. Asking parents to now choose between having some respite 
and providing their child with therapy is not a choice. Second, this approach assumes that everyone begins at the same starting line. Again, this is not the case. Children with autism spectrum disorder are found in families across a wide range of socioeconomic circumstances and they require highly variable levels of supports. A program based instead on need allows a reasonable and accountable approach. Consideration of the complexity of needs and the degree of need of each child and family is a clear way to provide reasonable assurance that the process of providing these resources is sound even to those who will not receive as many resources as they would hope for. What we know is that in a system where demand exceeds supply, as is often the case in healthcare and supportive services, when the process of allocating those resources is clearly and explicitly driven by consideration of needs and individual situations, people are then far more willing to accept that not everyone will or should receive the same level of service and benefits. Many parents note that they would rather wait for the right level of support than be provided with limited support that is not meaningful, not based on actual need, and that is simply not enough. The proposed plan does not treat children with autism as individuals with unique and varying needs. Further, the plan, by providing only a bare minimum of funding, shifts the burden of providing therapy to, for example, parents and teachers, who clearly have important roles in the lives of children with autism but those roles, often stretched to the limit already, should be alongside therapies and services. The proposed plan also shifts the burden to the future. Every dollar we invest meaningfully in a child now translate to, to an adult with more p potential. A system that provides individualized therapies for children with autism aims to allow each child to have the opportunity to lead a meaningful and dignified life by optimizing their unique capacities and ways of functioning. The current proposed reforms, as they stand, are a clear move in the wrong direction. Thank you. Hello. In 2016, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario stood with children, families, and autism advocates and rebuked policy changes that restricted access to IBI after age five. They even put forward a motion on their opposition day to extend IBI to all that needed it beyond, uh, regardless of their age. Here's a picture of, of the PC caucus uh, in May of 2016, standing with parents, demanding access to IBI, regardless of your age. Here's a picture of Lisa McLeod protesting with families in Ottawa, demanding access to intensive behavior intervention, regardless of age. Three short years later, the PC party under the leadership of Doug Ford calls parents professional protesters and has made a habit of calling the police on children, parents and grandparents in an attempt to paint them as extremists. This is not the Canada that I know. In an unbelievable act of hypocrisy and betrayal, the Conservative plan abolishes access to IBI for all children over and under the age of five and further discriminates based on their income, their symptom severity and their clinical need. In 2016, the Liberals came back to the table. They worked with advocates, families, and experts on a better solution. With revision, things were improving, and the wait list was quickly shrinking. More children were, were receiving evidence-based services more quickly than ever before. The Ford government has refused to engage with stakeholders, and instead insists on robotically repeating misleading talking points. I would like to address some of those talking points now. Talking point number one. The plan gives parents more choice. The plan explicitly removes the choice of the most rigorously re researched treatment option. Applied behavior analysis is endorsed as best practice by the Canadian Psychological Association, the American Psychological Association, the Surgeon General, the Society for Development in Behavioral Pediatrics, the National Institute of Mental Health, the American Academy of Neurology, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, but not the Government of Ontario. Doug Ford's autism policy is reversing decades of science-informed treatment and putting children and families in harm's way to save a buck. Talking point number two, 23,000 children were no, never going to get off the wait list, but would age out at 18 before ed, ever getting service. The truth is, is that regional providers have estimated that as many as 45% of that 23,000 have previously received behavioral treatment. Documents obtained under freedom of information request demonstrate the provincial average wait time of 21 months in the year before Lisa McLeod's intentional waitlist freeze. 
This is a significant reduction in waitlist time since the 2015 Auditor General's report. <coughs> before the ministry's secret waitlist freeze, more children were accessing treatment faster than ever before. No one was aging off the waitlist as 18, as Lisa McLeod continuously claims. But now, because of this heartless policy, most children will turn 18 never having access to intensive behavioral intervention. Talking point number three. The government extensively consulted parents and experts in the design of the Ontario Autism Program. We now know that the government coerced and threatened organizations for quotes of support, manipulated statements from parents, and greatly exaggerated the, the contributions of organizations like CHEO and Autism Ontario. The ministry did not meet with its own Lieutenant Governor appointed Clinical Expert Committee until February 14, 2019, one week after the announcement was made. According to a leaked ministry memo, invite-only roundtable consultations with parents occurred two months after the policy was already written. On January 18, 2019, when a clinical psychologist and behavior analyst expressed serious concern that the changes could put children at risk of harm, the minister's chief of staff told ONTABA that parents who want the gold standard should just remortgage their house. That's not providing choice, and that's not who we are as Canadians. In July of 2000, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized applied behavior analysis as a me medical necessity for individuals with autism. Accessible and effective treatment is a fundamental Canadian right and one of our country's core values. So why is this not true for the more than 500,000 Canadians living with autism spectrum disorders? This needs to change immediately. This is about more than autism. Every Canadian should be watching how the Ford government treats children with autism and asking themselves, is this how they'll treat me and my family when we are vulnerable? The reality is that each of our lifespans will far exceed our disability-free lifespan. What would you want for your family? With these changes, Doug Ford has said that children and youth with autism do not have potential, that their futures do not matter. If you disagree, contact your federal and provincial members of parliament to demand change now. There is still time to fix this. Pause the plan. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Mitzi Hunter and, and my co-panelists, and, and I want to echo everything that they've said this morning. Thank you. Um, so my name is Laura Kirby McIntosh. I'm the proud mother of two teenagers on the autism spectrum and a high school teacher, and I also have the honor of serving as the current president of the Ontario Autism Coalition. Today I want to respond specifically to the announcement on Monday by Education Minister Lisa Thompson. It's clear that the Ford government is creating one crisis after another for children and youth with autism. Her announcement regarding school supports for students with autism is far too little, coming far too late. Thousands of kids will effectively be kicked out of the Ontario Autism Program on April 1st, and they'll be thrust into a school system that is completely unprepared to address their needs. We first requested a meeting with the minister to address autism supports in schools shortly after she was sworn in. We requested a meeting again in December, specifically to address the issue of exclusions. Aside from a meeting with her parliamentary assistant in the fall, our requests that the minister meet with us have been completely ignored. Now for some specifics on what she announced. Firstly, the $12,300 amount per pupil being announced as new funding is simply the regular per pupil amount that any student would be awarded upon registering for school. This merely represents an extension of existing supports, not a new investment. It also appears that the funding is only for autistic students who are entering the school system for the first time as full-time students. However, many children in the OAP are already attending school part-time and they may not receive additional supports whatsoever. Secondly, the training for teachers completely misses the mark. Expecting teachers to take on the responsibility of picking students up after they've been kicked out of intensive therapy is both unrealistic and potentially dangerous. You cannot effectively train teachers to use ABA through an online course any more than you can teach someone to be a pro baseball player by showing them videos of last year's World Series. This government simply tells us that what the, what the Ford plan involves is trying to download autism services onto the schools. Next, this announcement does not address the lack of transition planning. Some children have only been given a few weeks short notice. Many children with autism and adults thrive on predictable routines and this is not a sufficient amount of time to prepare them for this abrupt transition. For me, 
as an educator, one of the most disappointing things about Monday's announcement was that it said nothing about the urgent need to hire more education assistants to help students, not just with autism, but may I say all disabilities. And it was also silent on the lack of adequate training provided to those EAs to help deal with the students that they are asked to support. I asked the minister's office yesterday if any of the PD or training will be offered to EAs, and they said they don't know. Monday's announcement was also silent on the broken funding formula that funds exceptional students not according to their needs, but on an outdated hypothetical, hypothetical statistical model. For years, boards have been spending more than they receive on special education, and Monday's announcement included a mere re-announcement of current funding levels. I suppose we should be grateful that there was not a cut. Lastly, Monday's announcement contains no provisions to provide direct classroom support to exceptional students from behavior, speech, physical, or occupational therapists. As a classroom teacher and as a mother who now finds herself an activist, I focused a lot of my work on getting politicians to understand the gap that often exists between the offices of cabinet ministers and the frontline workers for whom they make policy. In the case of the Ministry of Education, that gap is particularly wide. I'm deeply concerned that nothing in Minister Thompson's announcement is going to make any difference to my colleagues at the classroom level come April 1st. This feels like one big sick joke, but trust me, no one in our community is laughing. We're warning the Ford government that if they do not rethink the disastrous aut autism policies that have brought them nothing but criticism since their announcement, they will be responsible for what happens next. And I want to conclude my remarks by telling you what's been keeping me up at late, uh, late at night since the announcement of the OAP. Everything in my head, everything in my experience, and everything in my heart, as both a mother and a teacher, tells me that the following things are true. Somewhere in Ontario this spring, a student with autism will experience a sensory meltdown um, or overload. Um, their brain will tell them to run as fast as they possibly can in any direction they can and that child will run out of their classroom, off of school property and into a busy street or off into the woods or down into a river. Somewhere in Ontario this spring, a child with autism will be seriously injured after being improperly restrained by staff who haven't been trained on how to do it. The physical and emotional trauma to that child will last a lifetime. Somewhere in Ontario this spring, an education worker will be seriously injured, not because they lack compassion for our children and other children with exceptionalities, but because they don't have the necessary resources in the classroom to support them. That worker will be out of the classroom for weeks or months, and they will wonder why more was not done to protect them. And, significantly, somewhere in Ontario this spring, students without disabilities will watch these things happen, and they'll be traumatized. They won't understand what they're seeing, nor will they understand the systemic issues that are at play. They will come home from school and they will ask their parents questions that do not have good answers. But make no mistake, these events will take place because the Ford government, for reasons I cannot fathom, has chosen to manufacture a waitlist crisis and then implement a solution that makes intensive ABA inaccessible to thousands of children who need it. These choices will make classrooms less safe and supportive for all who spend time in them. As a teacher and as a mother and as an advocate, I say this to Doug Ford. You will be held accountable for your choices. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many unknowns. Doug Ford and Lisa McLeod need to hear from these experts, need to hear from parents and those with autism. Stop shifting the burden to the future. Pause the plan. We're witnessing a system on the verge of collapse because of bad policy. Vulnerable children and youth are being put at risk. School systems are completely unprepared to deal with this. <coughs> Our ask today is to pause the plan. We'll now take your questions. So apart from pausing the plan, what else could the government do? Like what would have fixed this situation? Well, I'm going to um, ask perhaps one of our uh, panelists to start uh, because there are many, many ideas and suggestions that have been brought forward. And um, I think that there is an existing Ontario Autism Program that was created with the input from experts, 
from parents and from children with autism themselves. And this government is taking a very simplistic approach. They're literally smashing that program, putting in something else that does not meet the needs and in fact drives out much of the capacity away from the system. There's so many unknowns. When you talk to agency providers, you talk to um, experts, no one knows the answer. We're starting a system in three weeks, less than three weeks, and there are so many unknowns. So um, the advice is to press pause and go back to the table with the advice of those who really know. I would just comment that there are, are a ton of solutions, you know, depending on how much time you have. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of answers. Um, this is done correctly in many jurisdictions for a fraction of the cost. Um, one of the big differences uh, in the, the current plan, um, as, as my pan uh, fellow panelists have uh, indicated, is that services are provided uh, directly based on the need of each individual. Those things are assessed by qualified clinicians. Those clinicians are, are regulated, which Ontario has not yet done. Um, and there is an auditing process, right? So in, in other jurisdictions, they want to ensure they're spending their money effectively. So when someone makes a decision saying a child needs 36 hours, there is someone else overseeing that decision and saying, why do you think 36 hours? What are the goals? When are we checking in to see if those goals are met, um, and that is an ongoing process to ensure, you know, financial responsibility and best out clinical outcomes for children. Um, Ontaba provided a fully a full comprehensive model to Lisa McLeod in their office. It was completely ignored, but it had oversight. It had financial considerations. It had policy uh, uh, analysis from other jurisdictions. Um, they didn't even look at it. So. Uh, first things first, let's pause, invite folks to the table, um, and then actually go through what can work. But there's there's lots of ways to fix this. There's lots of ways to do it for much cheaper. We're spending money we don't have to be spending. Mm -hmm. And if I could just add to that, I mean, the, the ask right now, and, and we've got some fantastic experts that are collaborating both inside and outside the Ontario Autism Coalition to uh, to, to write suggestions of, of, of what, what it would take to, to fix this mess. Um, I, the first thing, obviously, is funding that's based on needs. Um, at the second I, is what, what Louis just talked about, the need for regulation um, in the field. And then I would add, you know, two things that are in, in short supply in politics. Uh, one is long-term vision and thinking beyond the next election cycle. Um, and the other, um, these are big words, interministerial collaboration. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we need uh, Lisa McLeod's ministry and Lisa Thompson's ministry and Christine Elliott's ministry and probably a few others that I'm forgetting um, to sit down and really look at autism across the lifespan um, instead of trying to, to solve these problems in silos. Um, it's, you know, the system is already impossible for families to, to navigate. Um, and so what we need to do is tear those barriers down. But it all starts with pressing pause and bringing people back to the table for, for the consultation that didn't happen properly mm -hmm. this time. I, the only tiny thing I would add to, to these very good comments is that there's an assumption that a needs-based approach will be more expensive. Yeah, um, and that is an erroneous yeah. assumption. You. If you actually look at needs of individual children and families, um, some will need far more than others based mm -hmm. on complexity of children, based on their circumstances, um, and some will need far less. And what you'll also find is that if you really look at the needs, those who need more will get it, and yes, that will cost more. Those who need less will be actually very okay, will be completely comfortable with getting less, because they'll also know that children who really need it are getting the intensives and the variety of therapies they need, and that their children might not need that at this time. But they know that if those needs changed, or something changed about their family situation, there would be a responsiveness based on need. Mm -hmm. So the assumption that a needs-based program is more expensive is not actually the case. A pause seem unlikely at this stage given A, the short amount of time left to go, and B, Monday's announcement seemed meant to address one of the consequences of the plan come April 1st. So given that they're already putting in place a plan to address the consequences of the plan, um, how how likely do you think a pause? Yeah, but, but Monday's plan isn't a plan. Mm -hmm. And the changes to the OEP, it's it's not a good plan. Or um, a plan. Or it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's it's not, not a plan. plan. I, I mean, it is, it is never too late for a government to press pause and say, you know, it, it's a rare thing, 
But for a politician to say, you know, we missed the mark, we goofed a little on this, um, you know, we're, we're listening to the uproar. I mean, have you seen the list of organizations that have come out against this plan? It's the, it's the most impressive but occasionally random list I've ever seen. <laughs> Um, you know, we've got the Ontario Public School Boards Association, the Ontario Principals Councils, all the teachers unions, um, school boards, individual school boards, RAFI, the Arkells, a bishop. Um, <laughs> like it's just, it, it, and they keep coming in. Um, so why this government is doubling down and saying, well, this is the plan that will be implemented. Um, you know, I've, I've said in interviews in the last couple of weeks, I mean, they can be as stubborn as they want, but have they met us? Mm -hmm because um, we're not going to stop. Um, I, I think we have a, a, a right and a duty to, to call upon them to, to press pause and, and to get this right. There's too much at stake. There's literally lives at stake. Um, uh, Go ahead. I was just wondering if you could name some of the jurisdictions where you've been. Sure. So yeah. there's, there's yeah. very strong models in, uh, in Missouri, uh, South Carolina, uh, Virginia. Um, Massachusetts, uh, Alberta even has a model that I'm sure everyone in Ontario is very envious of right now. Mm. Um, there's there's challenges with Alberta as well, but uh, you know there is kind of needs based assessments. There's funding that you can acquire for your child specific um, complexities. Um, those are all all options. the The unfortunate part is that the government had a singular focus on the finances. They did not consult with anyone that we know of. Um, that has clinical or expert knowledge in autism. Mm -hmm. They consulted with financial advisors and they made a decision based on that. And now we're in a situation where we have a program that is completely absent of any clinical consideration or compassion for families. And, um, you know, I think going forward uh, with this plan, um, we'll, we'll have decades of, of ripple effects as far as cost and human cost. Yeah. You know, the one one quick example is that an inpatient admission when it, when an, an an individual is in crisis um, costs about two thousand dollars a day, and there's people that can be in hospital for five to ten to fifteen years because they have nowhere else to go and they don't have the support. So let's do the math of people not getting supports early and then ending up in hospital inpatient units for two thousand dollars a day over ten to fifteen years. Right? Pay now or pay later. This is one of the uh, very important considerations if. If we want to be responsible with taxpayer money, this is the absolute wrong direction. Yeah, well, yesterday the Premier had mentioned that uh, as a result of government policies, there has not been a single frontline uh, layoff. Have you, in, in the um, autism you know, services provider world, have you guys been seeing layoffs or hearing of layoffs that are impending? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There, so, so Kids Ability, a center that Lisa McLeod visited during the, the uh, December, January um, uh, roundtables just laid off eight therapists and one social worker. Um, there's been announcement at the regional providers that they would be uh, potentially laying off 200 to, th to 300 staff per center. Um, there's likely to be in excess of 1,500 jobs lost of young professionals, mostly women, that have had very specific training in this area. Uh, it will absolutely tank Ontario's capacity to provide behavioral services. So if down the road someone wants to fix this, you know, the question is, will they be able to, given the colossal damage that will be done to the capacity of clinical services in Ontario? And how would you classify these 1,500? The, the Premier said yesterday that uh, any layoffs would be limited to... These are to absolutely frontline staff. These are, these are the staff that are literally sitting across from a child with autism, um, teaching language, teaching safety skills, getting them ready for school. These are as frontline as you get. Um, so I... Again, I'm I'm just shocked by the misinformation that is being put out by the by the mm -hmm. by the premier. And this has the potential impact that colleges and universities, looking at mm -hmm. uh, the ability of their graduates in programs that train these qualified staff to uh, that they'll graduate and they won't have uh, positions. Um, you will see there's a strong potential that you'll see universities and colleges uh, restricting enrollment to these programs, thinking twice about whether they're going to continue these programs. So this effect right now has serious implications, again, for the future. One college program has already shut down uh, for the fall, the, the Autism Behavioral Science Program. So that is one, one lost college training program already. Uh, I anticipate that 
uh, similar things will happen across the other nine colleges that provide training for uh, frontline uh, behavioral therapists and instruct therapists. Um, I'm blanking on exactly which one it is. I can I, I can look it up for you later. Yeah. It's actually within our our document that we circulated, so you can have a look. Which I have here. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I should add on that that even before this announcement was made, we already had a capacity issue. Um, we'd been building capacity in Ontario for the last 20 years, um, but when we saw under the Liberal government, when we saw the initial funding roll out after the end of the H5 cutoff, we were meeting with officials from the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, as it then was, and we were tracking um, how many families were picking up the funding. And we saw these big zeros across the column from northern Ontario. And that told us that even though money was available to families, there were no providers up there for them to go and hire. Um, so this plan also has a particularly devastating impact on rural and northern and indigenous communities where access to, to this therapy is already hard. Now you're going to see BCBAs and frontline therapists um, either getting out of the field entirely uh, because they have to get a job somewhere or leaving Ontario and going somewhere like to the states where, where they can find work. Yeah, and I'd like to add on to that rural point as well. Uh, we know that kids in rural areas tend to get diagnosed later mm -hmm. than kids in urban areas. So this point, not only this program not only discriminates against girls, but it discriminates against kids in rural areas uh, because they're less likely to be diagnosed uh, or get diagnosed later uh, simply because there are less existing uh, health services in those areas. So they're going to get less money from this program simply because they're not living in downtown Toronto or Ottawa. So what then would be the perfect scenario? Because you know, the Premier mentioned yesterday it would take billions of dollars in order to satisfy all of the costs. That's not true. I, I, I get that yeah. you disagree, but <laughs> you know, if let's say it's a needs based program, what would be the perfect scenario in which every child gets exactly what they need. What would that cost and what would that look like? So we've got a bunch of experts that are that are working on exactly that right now. Um, I, I I disagree with the premier that it'll cost billions of dollars. Even if you, in, you know, Mike's the math guy here. I'm the social science teacher, so watch out. Um, but if you take 23,000 kids on the wait list, and you assume that, like the the regular autism population, there's a combination of levels there, right? Level one, two, three autism. So not all of them are at level three. So don't do 23,000 times. Eighty thousand dollars a year. Um, do some other numbers. Yeah, oh. um. <laughs> yeah. And that, I mean, and that, that's ex essentially the framing that the government has here. That this is about quantity of dollars. It's not. It's, not. it's about quality of dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the the fact is that they're wasting hundreds of millions of dollars here because they're not focusing on need. So what I would suggest is is what Louis suggested. Go back to the <coughs> existing program and tweak it. Tweak it around auditing and regulation of providers to make sure that. Uh, you know, kids aren't being sort of over-prescribed therapy. Mm -hmm. That's where you need to go. This isn't this isn't about quantity of money. It's just making sure that this money is spent as well as possible. The the one important thing to mention is that the um, diagnosed prevalence is not the same as the treated prevalence. And what I mean by that, and, and what everyone has already said, is that you know there is a full spectrum of need uh, on on the autism spectrum. And what they found in the other jurisdictions, so. Um, organizations like Autism Speaks have looked at Arizona, Missouri, um, Virginia, um, and what they found is that you know governments and insurers will project you know massive quantities of money because they say okay one in sixty six kids have autism costs eighty k a year whoa billions of dollars and suddenly they're you know terrified but the reality is when you set up a system that has quality oversight public regulation billing rate cards for what you can and can't do, maximum caps on the amount of hours you can provide per week, they spend about 20% of those projected costs. So we're throwing away money right now mm -hmm. uh, that we don't need to be. And this is the most frustrating part is we're, people aren't getting the therapy they need and we're throwing money in Lake Ontario. Like it's, you know, we might as well, um, you know, we might as well just chuck it in the garbage and burn it because no one's gonna get anything um, that will help them. And uh, it's, 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 tax you know, money. it's a new three word slogan for this government. Haste makes waste. Absolutely. That's exactly what's going on here. You know, they're quickly coming together with a plan that's incredibly wasteful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm offended both as a parent and, and a taxpayer on this that, uh, yeah. you know, we have this program that is so incredibly inefficient simply to hit, you know, the April Fool's Day deadline. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about 
with this April Fool's Day deadline? Mm. What happens in the classrooms on April 1st? As, as a teacher, I, I mean, I, look, I, I teach at a high school in, in Mississauga and a school for the arts. I, I do have some students with autism, but I'm thinking of my colleagues in elementary school classrooms um, where, you know, already they have large classes, they have kids with multiple needs. So a new kid shows up at their doorstep. Um, and, you know, is there anything that's going to help that teacher on April 1st? No, nothing. There is promise of some PD that, that will happen sometime next year. Um, now, I've attended lots of PD in 25 years of teaching. Some of it's been great. Some of it's been not so great. As a mom of a kid with autism, I'd be all too happy to attend some, some PD on autism. But I know that for some of my colleagues, the understandable reaction is, oh, great. Now I've got to be an expert in that, too. Like, we get PD every year on um, how to help students with anaphylactic allergies, um, how to help students with concussions, um, how to support LGBTQ students, how to support racialized minorities, how to support kids with mental health issues, ESL learners, refugees, on and on and on and on. Um, that's why I said I'm, I'm so disappointed that this training may not be available to education assistants. Um, and the thing about that is, a, there's not nearly enough education assistants. B, they're paid crap. Sorry, they're paid badly. Um, and, and C, they're the ones that actually want this training. I've met with our friends at QP and, and some of the other unions. These EAs, you know, they're the ones that, that, are, um, that are on the front lines with our kids every day, and they want this training desperately. Why this plan that was, was announced doesn't include them, I, I don't know. But, but again, that gap between nice words from the minister and the minister's office and then what's happening in Johnny or Susie's classroom on April 1st, um, they're just going to have to make it up as they go, and, and that's why I'm so scared. And I think there are many, I look at my daughter, my daughter's at Oakwood Collegiate in a classroom for a specialized classroom for kids with developmental disabilities, with autism, with a range of special needs, a classroom that works really well. And that is wonderful uh, because the teacher there is significantly invested. The teachers there are invested and trained and this is where they want to be. I see that if we suddenly increase the class from what it is now, it's eight or 10 to 30, with no additional EA support, with no real plan, um, that the, the classrooms that are now working really well for kids with autism and with other kinds of disabilities will suddenly become precarious. So I think it not only disrupts, and it disrupts in a number of ways. We already know that a lot of students are only spending half or, or going home early because they are on the spectrum and a lot of times teachers simply can't handle them. Do you think that this will become much more prevalent? Well, our, our organization has, and um, along with the AODA Alliance have, have spoken out about the use of exclusions on, on students with autism. And I'm, I'm semi-pleased that Monday's announcement included uh, a promise to hold a virtual consultation on exclusions. I, I prefer in-person consultations, personally, but oh, it's, it was an admission that, that at least something needs to be done on the use of exclusions. Um, but there's there's both, you guys know the difference between a hard exclusion and a soft exclusion. Because I think you're, okay, so a hard exclusion is when a principal uses, oh, I'm gonna sound like a nerd, section 265 1M of the Education Act. Um, and you can talk to our friends at Arch Disability Law about this, because they've done some excellent work on it too. Um, where, say, after a, a child with autism has had a massive meltdown, um, they basically say, without suspending or expelling the kid, you are not allowed to come back until further notice. This happened to my son once, and he was excluded for close to six months. Um, so it's a huge problem. But there's also the soft exclusions, like you're talking about, where you know the kid goes to school and is having trouble coping in the classroom environment, um, and and starts to to have some challenging behaviors. And the school calls and says, "Can you come and pick them up?" Well. I have a job. <laughs> so if I go pick, I mean, my kids are teenagers and they're okay now, but when they were little, if I leave my classroom to go get my son, then what happens to the 30 kids in my classroom? Um, and, and so, the, you know, there's these workplace impacts that you, you heard about early, uh, earlier. Um, and then you have other really cruel exclusions, like 
you know, Ms. McIntosh, I'm calling because your, your son has a field trip uh, next week and we just, we really don't think that we're going to be able to support him to be successful on this field trip. And so we're going to ask you if you could either, if you could keep him at home or, or if that's too hard, maybe you could accompany him on the field trip. That happens all the time. Our kids are excluded um, formally and informally. They're excluded from um, school assemblies um, and awards uh, ceremonies. Um, it, it's a real problem. So I think that um, when you look at the picture for April the 1st, uh, you're taking, uh, you're shifting, this government is shifting the burden from its responsibility onto individual parents. And teachers. And teachers, but first to the parents, because they're going to be moving from advocating on behalf of their child with autism to get the care and the treatment that they need and that they deserve. And you're putting them into a situation in the education system that is not prepared. Because those, uh, those children with autism, students with autism that can be in a classroom are already there for at least a portion of the day. The government is saying that they are turning off the funding mechanisms as of April 1st under the Ontario Autism Program. So those agencies that are either direct service agencies or direct funded agencies are really in a state of uncertainty and they're starting to lay off their resources because they can't responsibly commit to staffing without a funding stream to back it up. The government is saying we're taking, we're canceling that funding stream and we're giving the funding to parents. It's trying to figure out what the assessment mechanism is going to be. We saw CHEO post a notification. I know Mike, you posted that yesterday saying we're not really certain what the program will look like. So it's actually forcing providers, existing providers with existing capacity to, to have an unknown uh, area. And that drops the service level for parents and families. So they're going to be turning to the school system and to the education system that is ill-prepared and with no additional funding. The $3 billion for special education funding is the same as it has always been. The Monday's announcement did not provide new funding for that. <clears throat> I also want to bring attention to my colleague Natalie DeRosier's concern that she put out, and that's the human rights concern. Mm -hmm. That now you're, you're really forcing families to take their concern to the Human Rights Commission because their child is being denied treatment and care that they're, they're, in, they're supposed to be receiving, that they should be entitled to, and an education system that is being put into a, uh, just a, an, 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 a difficult situation where these students are being put into the classroom without the supports to keep them there safely and where they're actually learning. Why would this government do that? They have an existing program that is working, that needs more funding, more oversight, more capacity, but the mechanisms are there and, uh, and they're just breaking that apart and they have to be held responsible for that. Um, at this point, if the government doesn't pause the program and they go ahead as planned, um, you've mentioned that if, come April 1st, there may not be um, much in terms of changes. Can anything be done at this point um, to ease that transition? Or are we is it now too late, two weeks away, to, to put things into place um, in the school system to, to help with that? Gosh, I wish I could think of something. Yeah, I, I can't say. It's 10 school days. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they need to have, EA, you know, extra EAs in the classroom and things like that. I don't, I, I don't know how you hire someone in, in 10 school days. I don't know where you would find uh, the, these people. Um, there's there's just no time here and again it's just to hit the, you know uh, an arbitrary deadline is to hit you know basically to hit the new fiscal year that's yeah. essentially what this government yeah. is doing they're, they're you know making a plan to make things easier on the accountants but unfortunately it's making it harder on the teachers and the kids right and the ASD uh, training for teachers which is not mandatory it's a voluntary training the funding for that doesn't start until September so the the April 1st deadline is a hard date 
for turning off the funding stream for those agencies that are providing support <coughs> out into the community. But as it relates to the education system, not much capacity is going to change and improve on April 1st when they have to be dealing with, and, and this, this is hundreds of, um, of, of students, children with autism, uh, who have a variety of needs that parents are going to be saying, well, this is what, what we've been told to do, and the system is not yet prepared to respond. Um, changing a professional development day um, from literacy and numeracy, which is what it is now, to autism, while it's a, it's a, it's a good suggestion, it doesn't solve the system capacity uh, and needs issues in the school system to deal with this. And what's the impact for the other students in the classroom? Because all of a sudden we will have hundreds of children with autism entering a classroom without support. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to the learning environment for the rest of the students? I, I don't want to give the impression that, that our students are, are going to come in and start throwing chairs and, and no. wreaking havoc. Um, our kids are awesome in a whole bunch of ways. And, and one of the beautiful things about inclusive education is that it teaches kids from a young age that these are people that are part of your community. And no, we don't lock them away anymore. They, they come into our community. That being said, if I'm honest as, as a mother, um, I know that sometimes my kids exhibit challenging behaviors that other kids won't understand. So in, in this fight, we need families and in and, and particular parents of, of kids who are so-called neurotypical to join us to say, hey, this has an impact on my kid too. Um, and, and not in a like get that kid out of here kind of way, but like, hey, we want a learning environment that's that's good for everybody. Um, and you know, we we know that the, the the teachers and the education workers stand with us. Um, I've had multiple meetings with them, and they really understand. Um, and I give them full credit for this: that that my child's learning conditions are their members' working conditions. It's two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So you know, the theme song is "We're All in This Together" from well, High School well, Music. Right? You also have a government that has told school boards to freeze hiring yeah. and, you know, <laughs> to get prepared for perhaps a change in class size caps. So, you know, there there is a, a cut that is coming to education at a time yeah. when w the government is asking the, the education system to <coughs> respond um, in an ill-prepared way to the needs of students with mm -hmm. autism. It just does not make sense. One, one has to wonder if, if, if they want a crisis. You guys have been around long enough to remember John Snowblen talking about creating a crisis in education. Um, but this isn't, this isn't a game. This is, like, this is about kids' quality of, of life, quality of learning. It's about their safety. Um, so, I mean, to me, there's, I'm not going to be telling any jokes on April 1st. It's, it's not going to be a funny day at, at all. Um, I wanted to touch a bit on, on the, uh, the question of, of the impact on, on the classrooms and as well as like the, uh, level of preparation of schools in Ontario. So, uh, my wife and I went to, uh, visit the principal of, of our children's school. They don't have, uh, autism or intellectual disability, but one's in, in junior kindergarten and one's in grade one. Uh, they're in very large classrooms already and there's been some challenges as far as just kind of them being able to manage and access the curriculum um, just within the the low resources that exist in the schools already um, and so in a discussion with the with the principal um, a little over a week ago you know we said are you ready for this autism thing and he's you know the, the answer was like what autism thing you know and so that's <laughs> the, the first kind of concern and so then we laid it out on the table and i said what what are the capacity what capacity do you have to support you know, let's say two, three, four children with autism, one of which may have very high needs, the others may have, you know, uh, less high needs. Um, he said, and the answer we got was, while there's one autism resource teacher shared between about 11 schools, they come to the school once a month and they can kind of give advice on autism. And I said, okay, do you have capacity for two EAs to, to be with a child that may engage in severe self-injury? Absolutely not, right? So. 
This is the reality of how prepared the school system is. They don't know any of the details still with 10 days to go. Um, they don't have the resources to support these students. And they have a typical transition process that they do, right? So they, for weeks and months, they assess, they meet with the family, um, they assess need, they plan, um, and they don't do that in 10 days. Typically that's done over like a three to six month period. So, you know, that was another answer I got. Well, what, you know, we usually do like a, a three, four month process and I'll, you know, I'm looking at my watch thinking, I don't know where you have time for that. So uh, again, I just think that you know, the autism community is concerned, but everyone in Ontario should be concerned and, and, and parents of children, school age children should be concerned um, that you know, the quality of education of all students, including those with autism, is going to be negatively impacted by the government's decisions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll add on to that. This, well, <laughs> There's many things that frustrate me about the fact that, that we're, we're back where we were three years ago in, in terms of fighting ab about autism. But one of the things um, that frustrates me is that you know, like autism is in the spotlight right now, um, but our fight is situated in a larger fight um, for disability rights in general. And you know, I've never wanted for, for this fight to take energy or attention away from any other disabilities. So if I was a parent of a kid with another disability in school right now, I would also be very concerned um, about, uh, about the impact. Um, and then the other thing that I just wanted to, to let you guys know is we do have an autistic self-advocate in the, in the audience today. So if you have any questions about his school experience, feel free to, yes, to ask Miko me. Yes, will <laughs> take your questions as well. Yeah. So thanks, thanks everyone um, for being here today. Thank you so much uh, to the panel for offering Thank your you. advice Thank to you. this government. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks.